Okay, let's begin with the word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful, Lord, for this opportunity again to study together. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be here and that you can keep uh, the technology working uh, for each person, that we can uh, come together and share the things that you're teaching us and that we can examine um, our understanding of things in the past and that they can be corrected. And we ask, Lord, that we can reflect your character in all that we do. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, I managed to get the study from yesterday up in the morning. Uh, I found uh, a program that was really quickly spliced the two pieces together. And uh, so I got it up before I went to work. So that was good. And uh, you're looking at something here that, that's um, related to what we're, we're dealing with, but it's, it's part of a history that um, came from a study that I was doing, uh, that I present, that Jeff was doing, and that I looked at in a bit more detail. And I haven't looked at it uh, since, uh, but this is dealing with the Great Seal. So it's a study on the dates related to the Great Seal. And if you go to Wikipedia, you'll find these dates. That's where I got them from. Um, and uh, I'm going to zoom in a bit more. Click on there. Okay. So I have these dates at the top in, in a chart just for the counting of them, but uh, that's not that important at this point. Um, so the Great Seal of the United States, what would be its significance prophetically? Beside the inclusion of the all-seeing eye. Well, yes. How about the year that it was uh, it was implemented and selected? Okay, but I'm just talking about as a symbol. What does the seal mean prophetically? Yeah, we're going to look at the dates and so forth. Hadn't given that much thought yet. Okay, so what's the seal of God? I would say the Sabbath. Yeah, and, and what does the seal show? The person, the office, the dominion. Okay, right. So... So that, that would be the same uh, dealing with this seal in this sense, um, that it's, it's just like the Sabbath. It has characteristics of, of any governmental seal. And um, so now this, this is used, um, there, there are different seals. There's different versions of the seals as well. Correct? Pretty much. Yeah, so um, because the president has a seal, um, Congress has a seal, I believe. Um, so different people in different offices have different uh, authority. So they, they all have seals. And, and there's all kinds of seals that exist within government, legal seals, judicial seals, and so forth. But so this is called the Great Seal. Now, it's kind of interesting uh, because we mark the beginning of the United States, July 4th, 1776. And it's on that date that they uh, first make a committee. Now, I'm not an expert on American history. So can somebody who is tell me what is the significance of July 4th, 1776? Well, that was the, the date that was said that was the um, Declaration of Independence was accepted and proclaimed. 
Right. So you have the Declaration of Independence. Now, it's not technically signed on that date, is it? I didn't say signed. Yeah. Accepted. Yeah, accepted. So um, I'm not sure all the history of the Declaration of Independence, but but that's when it's accepted. So they they would have some kind of a vote and they're going to then have a committee to make a seal. Well, I find it, I find it very interesting that the person that became the third president, the first president to truly go up against Islam was the one that wrote the Declaration of Independence. So Thomas Jefferson. Correct. So the question I would have here, is it possible that Jefferson could have been a symbolic representation for the third angel's message? Okay. Um, possibly. I'd, I'd have to think about it more. I mean, one is I'm not... I'm not really an expert on American history, which which I hate that fact because you know I was raised in Canada, and and we didn't learn about American history, so I got a lot of my American history mostly just from TV, uh, which isn't really the best place to get it, um, and then in studying this message, but um, we're going to look at at these, they're going to have a first committee, a second committee, and a third committee. So you just mentioned about the three angels' messages. And so, you know, exactly why they have these committees formed, um, what would be the reason that they're, I mean, I, I think you could read about it in Wikipedia, but it, it looks like the job isn't really getting done and that you need these committees in this, for this process. And then they're finally going to choose someone named Charles Thompson uh, to um, to actually design this. So the third committee is finally going to choose someone. Now, I want to look at some of these dates. So um, now, 1776, does anybody know the significance of that number? I don't understand your uh, I just, question. It has some characteristics. There's the characteristics about the number 1776. Well, the, the biggest on that would be that this would be 22 years before uh, the Pope was taken captive. Yeah, okay. So, so that's historically. I just mean as a number. So this is really, I'm probably asking Stephen and Iran. So it's a doubling of 888. Correct, right? So 1776 is you take the number 888 and you double it. And what's the significance of 888? Isn't it the Geomatra for Jesus? Yeah. Yeah, so it's the Gematra for Christ. And eight is a symbol of the resurrection, and it's tripled. And so uh, people like um, Louis F. Weir has pointed this out, that we can look at these numbers symbolically. And just like we have 666 is the mark of the beast, and 777, of course, is a number that relates to the Sabbath, 888 is a number that relates to the resurrection. And so, and, and to Christ, to his resurrection. So the fact that it's doubled of 888 has been noticed by many people as significant as in regard to the United States rising. Uh, and it begins to rise here in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence, but also with this committee that's going to work on the Great Seal. Now, we also have some years in here, um, 1780, 1782. Now, Iran was just sharing with me some significance regarding 
1782. Uh, Iran, can you share some significance regarding that? What do you share? Uh, well, that's when William Miller was born. And uh, I also noticed that 45 years later, Ellen White was born. And it, it has the same combination of numbers as 1872 uh, in both of those years. And then another 45 years later is 1872. Right. So if you take uh, this year, 1782, and you add 45 to it, so that's the year Miller was born, and you add 45 to it, you get 1827, the year Sister White was born. And it's, so it's the same four digits, just in a different order. And then when you add 45 to it again, you get the number 1872 which is a tenth of that symbol for um, July 18, 2020. Um, now, it, it's, it, it doesn't happen if you keep adding 45, you're not gonna get anything out of it or subtracting 45. So just those three years have this relationship and it happens to be connected with Miller and Sister White's the year that they're born. So. So it's an interesting detail. So 1782 um, is also when Miller is born. So that's one significance there. Now, um, actually, I, I think I put together a paper on this. So I should send it to people because this was just the diagram. Um, so I put together a paper, I, and I just remember now that I did, that I sent to Jeff. And because he was dealing with some of this history of the Great Seal. Um, and so it has these different dates and, and what happened. Um, now, the dates in and of themselves, uh, I'd already had these dates marked for other things, dealing with Thanksgivings and so forth. But the significance really here had to do when I looked at this period of time. And um, so we have a period of 13 years from uh, the time when they first put this committee and then they, uh, they finally, uh, the United States Congress ordered that the seal heretofore used by the United States in Congress assembled shall be and hereby is declared to be the seal of the United States. So once it becomes the seal of the United States in an official declaration, um, it's a period of 13 years. Now, also I'm counting the periods of days and so forth. Um, I notice that uh, it can be divided into a period of six years and seven years. Um, and, and the six years that, that's marked there is this date, uh, June 20th, 1782, when the design is submitted and accepted. It's going to be seven years. Uh, until it actually is enacted. Now there's a period of 88 days from when uh, that occurs to when the seal is first used by Thompson and kept in his care for seven years. So, so the seal is used by him 88 days later and then it's going to be kept in his care until uh, September 15th. And you'll notice that that date is September 16th, 1782 to September 15th, 1789. It's almost exactly seven years. So uh, there's a lot more to this. I mean, I just noticed that there was 25, 20 days. If I went um, to October 22nd, 1782 to September 15th, uh, 1789. So it ties in this October 22 date by a period of 25, 20 days. Um, so there's there's just all these little details, which I don't remember all of them. I, I noticed that there was 777 days between the two committees. Um, and whatever that means, it's hard to say, but that's just what I noticed. Um, so uh, I bring this up because we have here things in connection with the Great Seal. 
uh, that show uh, design. That these, that this is the, the rise of the United States, the events that occur with the United States are not happenstance. They have design. God has purposefully um, uh, done this. And you're going to see I have, you know, the one, two, three, and then the four. It's almost like the third angel's messages and then the fourth. So whatever people think about this, I think one thing that we could say is that there appears to be design, whatever that means, uh, you know, how that's going to be interpreted. Any thoughts on this before I, I go to other things? Yeah, probably if we look at the paper, and maybe I'll go through the paper in more detail later. Yeah, you had a comment? Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, have you have you counted the leap years in that? I don't know what you mean by counted the leap years. Oh, well, the day, like I, I wanted to get the exact days. Like I wouldn't know what the 13 years is unless I figured out which years were normal years and which years were leap years. Well, I'm just being picky. Well, if it's the year is divisible by four, then it's a leap year. Um, so you're trying to count things, and that's what you want to know. The, which oh, one? yeah, because I see you have six years, 21, 77 days, and so on. And that most of the 13 years didn't have the days. So I was trying, hmm, I wonder which ones are normal years and which ones are leap years. Uh, okay, yeah. So all the ones that are divisible by four are leap years on, on, on our calendar, right? So um, otherwise there's 365 days in a year. Um, okay, so we're gonna come back to this at some point because I, I know that there are some other significant things about this that I don't really remember at the present time. Uh, there was another part of this history that uh, escapes me right now. Now, um, the next chart that I have here, uh, this is just a continuous line instead of all in one line. Uh, I placed it in three separate lines. Uh, the first line at the top is the history dealing with uh, November 22nd, 977 BC. Um, I have no idea why it says 222 under there. I just think that's probably a typo of some sort. Um, so November 22nd is going to be involved in this uh, Thanksgiving uh, prediction of November 22nd, 2018. So you can see this is at the end here. And it says it's the 14th day of the eighth month, not the 15th day of the eighth month. And I've actually had some problem in trying to decide what date it is. So it's, it's one of those dates that happens occasionally where it's very difficult to determine what's the actual biblical date. And as we talked about yesterday, there's the 235 years that lead to a period of 19 years and then a period of 154 years, which is 22 weeks or two periods of 77 days, because, or, or as a symbol, right? So when I say it's 22 weeks, um, I mean, it's 22 weeks of years or 77 plus 77, but I put there 22 weeks. Um, and, and then you're going to see that, and, and whether you go from um, 721 or from, to 586 or from 723 to 588. Um, so it would be a period of 154 years to the first day of the first month. So, um, and then we have these decrees here, August 9th, December 8th, August 9th, 1623. This is a Thanksgiving. December 18th, 1777 is also a Thanksgiving. Or, or um, and I believe that's the first, first time that the, 
I'm trying to remember how that works. So that would be the first Thanksgiving that they proclaimed, I believe. I'm going to have to look at my, my chart. Um, and then you have George Washington's um, Thanksgiving. So you're going to have like the first one that's going to be on the 28th, and um, which is on the fourth Thursday in November. And then I believe it's George Washington's in 1789. I need to go to my, my list here. I actually have them all here. Yeah, so Madison's pro proclamation we have in there as well, George Washington's in 1789. And it's proclaimed on October 3rd, 1789. So I know this is a lot of information, but we're just going to go over this again. So the Con Continental Congress, it's going to have its first uh, Thanksgiving on December 18th. So it's not going to be the fourth Thursday in November. And then um, and November 5th, 1782 is also going to be a Thanksgiving, or that's going to be a proclamation, pardon me, and it's going to be observed on November 28th. So that's the first time they're going to have it on the fourth Thursday in November. And then George Washington is going to make his first proclamation in 1789 on October 3rd, and the Thanksgiving will be on November 26th, 1789. And then we're gonna have um, on January 1st, 1795, Washington proclaimed a Thanksgiving again, and it's going to be observed on Thursday, February 19th. So. You're going to see that these Thanksgiving days are going to be on different times. So Washington has one that's on the 4th, November and Thursday, 4th, Thursday in November, and one that's just in February. And then Madison um, is going to have a proclamation on November 16th, 1814, and the Thanksgiving will be on January 12th, 1815. So I think I put these in here to show that there isn't this consistency until Lincoln's proclamation, October 3rd. So notice it's the same date uh, that Washington is gonna make his proclamation. And it's October 3rd, 1863. And again, it's also gonna be on November 26th. So there isn't the fact that it's the same number of days um, is, is odd because there is no regularity from the date that it's proclaimed to the date that it occurs. So Lincoln happens to use the same date as Washington. And to me, this is tying the revolution together with the Civil War, these two proclamations having the same dates. Any thoughts on this? I know this is a lot of information to think about. Do we see significance in these proclamations? There may be well, well be significance to this. I guess I would have to take this and place it on a line to really get a, a visual representation for myself. Yeah, now, I mean, I do have them on a line like this. Right. Um, they're just so you know, if I go like this, you can see this progression of these uh, dates. And you can see this is the different histories of literal Israel, then the history of the United States uh, in the revolution, and then the Civil War, and then finally in the present time. Now, uh, what I put here is I put on, on, in this one, I put the biblical dates, whoops, underneath. And, uh, you know, I don't see any lining up other than I have one that's the 10th day of the 10th month. But as far as the biblical date back here, November 22nd, 977 BC, being the 15th day of the eighth month, um, that is where in our history that we start to see these lining up again in, in a particular way, not with November 22nd. Um, and of course, the biblical date 
back here, this is a Julian date, November 22nd. Um, and, you know, it's drifted quite a bit. Um, so it would be November 13th, um, 977 BC on the Gregorian calendar. So you're not really often going to have uh, the 15th day of the eighth month line up with Thanksgiving. Now, what I'm going to try to illustrate here, which we sort of laid the foundation for this yesterday, but I, I felt that I needed to go over this to some degree. So I'm just going to uh, do a quick review. So we have a counterfeit feast day in 977 BC by Jeroboam, and he's going to offer upon the altar in Bethel. And we know that Northern Israel typifies the United States. Um, it's the false prophet and the United States is going to become the false prophet. Um, it has the two horn power, Dan and Bethel being uh, the civil power being Dan, being a judge and um, Bethel being the house of God that's being the religious power or the church. And we have this revolution and it's tied to this civil war and by 235 years. And this civil war is tied to the beginning of the 2520 for Northern Israel uh, in 723 BC. So, so to me, this is significant. Okay, so let's I'm gonna I'm gonna draw this on the board. Um, I already have it drawn on the board, but I really I know that people. I'm not sure how well people are doing at following this, especially with the interruptions that we had yesterday. Um, so let's and 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 I need some feedback here just to make sure that people are grasping what's happening. <clears throat> so in this simple way of looking at this, you have 235 years, and that's 235 months, a period of 19 years. And so that we have this 19 years here at the beginning with these 235, this is tying together what we would call the revolution with this civil war in 742 BC. Does that make sense to people that I can take these two periods of years and months and now go to 723 BC and say that this history here is connected to this history here? That, that should be pretty obvious. Anybody have trouble with what I'm doing? It's clear to me. Okay. And so we have 1798, because we already understood this, that this is the United States. It rises in 1798, according to Ellen White. Now, it has a revolutionary history that leads to that. But then we're going to see that this is connected to this by these 65 years. And so we can see quite clearly that the revolution, the American Revolution, I know I have it written down below, is connected to this civil war. By that, those 65 years. Now these 65 years, connect Judah to this civil war. And, and of course, that's going to be, um, be done how? How are we doing this? Just like we have these 19 years here, can we argue that these, this period of 235 months that represent 19 years is tying 
together uh, this 2520 to the rise of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1863. So, so that shouldn't be a problem for us as, as people in this movement. So we can see that Northern Israel and this civil war back here and Judah are all tied together in this, this structure of the prophetic mirror. Because this prophetic mirror, what is it about? It's uh, connecting ancient Israel to spiritual Israel. Okay, and is it connecting then uh, northern Israel to the United States? Yes. Yeah. So, so we can see that that connection is there. So there's nothing really here that's, that's new, except that we have more evidence and details that we can look at. Now, the question is, can we take this structure now and connect it to events at the present time? So that's, that's really the issue. And what we were looking at was this civil war between the North and the South. And, and this civil war between the North and the South, when we look at it, we've already made applications regarding um, Isaiah chapter 7 and chapter 8 regarding the history here that this battle between the North and the South in ancient Israel is tied with the history that we have looked at as a battle between the North and the South in our history. Now, the problem that we have had, and I don't think that we've sorted it out completely, but if we're going to look at our history, we know that it begins in 1989. Now, 1989 is connected to 1863 by 126 years. Now, it's not 235 years. But is there any way we can relate what we see here connecting the prophetic mirror back to this history that we can connect 1863 to 1989 as being a mirror of that? Or, or is there something else that we need to look back to uh, in this history? Because what's this history about? It, it, when we read it in um, 1 Kings chapter 12 and chapter 13, what is it really about? Is it about church and state? Yes, the merger of church and state and setting up of an, an idolatrous worship. Yeah, and that's what this 15th day of the eighth month is about. It's about church and state being combined because he's offering on Bethel, uh, Jeroboam is, and he's, he's a king, but he's acting as a priest. So that's church and state combined. And even his whole setting up of the two golden calves, one in Dan and one in Bethel, suggests a two-horned power, just as we see rising in 1798. Now, so this is about church and state. Now, we also have a history going back. So if we go from 742 back 1,206 or 126 years, what history do we come into? Um, it's part of me. So what's this history in 868 BC? Is that Ahab? Okay, so it's the history of Ahab is in this history. Um, 
And, and that's about church and state as well. Correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of this. I maybe will at some other point. But we can take this 126 years here and, um, and look at that. Now, you know, this is going to end up being um, 109 years over here, whether that has any significance. I don't know. But anyway, that's the history we have here. So we're connecting this revolution and this history um, is going to be a history about church and state. That's what Northern Israel is about. And now we're in our history. Now we have other things that we can connect, right? We know that we have um, a period of 25 years here to 1888. And I'm not, I'm not trying to muddy the waters here. It's just that we know we have in our history in 2014, we also have this period of 126 years. So, so we've made this connection that we can, we can break these periods up into different periods of time. And, and maybe there's something here that we haven't looked at yet. But as we're going forward in, in this line here, we're going to have uh, a significant year, and that's going to be uh, 2017. So what's 2017 for this movement and for this line? What's 2017 about? What happens in 2017? Samuel Snow's letters. Okay. So, so we have a whole bunch of light. You're talking you about have, Samuel Snow's yeah, letters. Yeah, organization. We have organization, right? Um, you know, we have we have light uh, that comes to this movement regarding Rafi and Paneum, right? I mean, technically, it's in, in December that we first know about Rafi, but it's first presented by Jeff um, in 2017. Um, and really Paneum here in, in, in Alberta, he presents it. Um, so so we, have, we have this, but we also have Trump really becomes the president, right? His inauguration. So we have a lot happening in 2017. Um, it becomes, it becomes a, a filled with events and dates and our structure, uh, the center of our structure of the 2777 chiasms is June 22nd, 2017, an important date. So we have all these things uh, in 2017. Now, with Samuel Snow's letters, uh, we also have some way marks that we come to understand. One is we come to understand 2014 in a particular way. But these things we have still not come to full agreement on. That is, some people know about them, but don't really understand them. And, and I don't think that we understand them still correctly. That is, there's things that we have to examine. So in 2018, we're going to have this movement uh, make a prediction, right? So in 2018, we're going to make a prediction. The first prediction is really maybe not the movement making it, 
but it's Daniel from Brazil saying October 13th, 2018. And that's going to become part of this structure that later is going to be fleshed out by events that happen in this movement. Um, but we also are looking at these external events. And so in 2018, we're going to be, once we are time setting as such, we're going to have this prophecy that is what we're going to do is we're going to take this history here. We're going to look at November 22, 977 BC and its connection with the 15th day of the eighth month as a counterfeit feast day and make a prediction regarding 2018. Now, Trump in 2017, that's going to be Trump's first Thanksgiving. So Trump has his first Thanksgiving after he becomes president. But we're now going to make a prediction then in 2018 regarding the significance of the next Thanksgiving. So I'm just going to put like a timeline here. And so we're going to have this here, November 22nd. So that's going to be the first Thanksgiving that Trump has on November 22nd. Uh, when would this Thanksgiving have been? Do you understand how the calendars work? What? I'll, have to check, I'll have to check the calendar. <laughs> okay. So one is we don't have a leap year in here. And so you're going to find that every year Thanksgiving is going to be one year, one day later, correct? So if somebody yeah, looks at Google is given 23rd. Okay, so it's going to be one day earlier. So they say the 23rd? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's the other way. So it's going to be one day earlier. So in 2019, it would be the 21st. And then in 2020, it would be the 28th. Um, unless there was a leap year in there, which there was. So, um, so anyway, I, I can't remember how it works. But I think, yeah, what every year it becomes one day earlier, unless there's a leap year. So but anyway, this isn't the 22nd is my main point. So the first time that Trump is going to have this date connected with him is going to be in 2018. So this November 22nd becomes significant. And that was the basic premise. So we looked at this, we saw that we could connect this history with the past and that we had all of these Thanksgivings that we're connecting as well. So is it unreasonable what, what we're doing? Is this, is this a stretch to look at these feast days, these Thanksgivings, and say, well, it's connected with a civil war in 977 BC. And so maybe it's connected, and, and that's the revolution, we'll call that. But is it, and it's also connected with the American Revolution. And we can tie through that November 26, 1789 revolutionary Thanksgiving with the Civil War Thanksgiving of November 26, 1863 with Lincoln. So we're connecting George Washington and Lincoln. And is it reasonable to connect George Washington and Lincoln? What is the connection between these two, besides the fact that they're in wars? George Washington was the first president of the Republic. Okay. And Lincoln was the first president to have to stand to try to keep a Republic united. Yeah, and he's also the first Republican president. Okay, I, I don't disagree there. Yeah, so, and, and, and when 
you know, when the average person outside of the United States thinks of presidents from the past, I mean, we're not going to really know too many presidents, but we're all going to know, know George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, and, and I would think they would be the most famous presidents. And maybe it's partly because of the time in which they're president. A revolutionary war and a civil war. Now, you know, for some people who are historians, they might have a lot of other presidents they think are noteworthy. But if somebody's going to name an American president other than, you know, one that's current, um, those would be the ones that people would name. Now, we also have this period, uh, which somebody could say is arbitrary, from August 9th, 1623, to December um, 18th, 1777. But we tie together these two different Thanksgivings, the first civil Thanksgiving, and then the first Thanksgiving by the con group, um, Continental Congress of the United States. And, and then we have this period from Lincoln's Thanksgiving to Trump's first Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's November 23rd, it says on, on there. And now, so we're, we were in November, we were about um, a few days before maybe November 15th. Um, we, we had started it a little bit before that, just studying the Civil War. But when we started looking at this November 22nd date, uh, yeah, okay, so 868 BC is about the 17th year of Jehu. There's, uh, and, and that's why we have to look at it. There's a connection there, which I want to get into. So it's, it's not so much about Jehu, it's about, uh, there's a period of time in there that's going to be tied on to that 126. So that's why I don't want to do the study right now. They're just commenting on the, the chat there. Uh, there is a study in the way that we connect it with Ahab. So we'll look at that later because we have another period of 25 years that we can add. So um, now, so what we have here then is this November 22nd, 2018 date. And you can see here on this chart, it says it's the 12th day of the eighth month. So I want to look at this. Now, I know this can be a little bit tedious. But I, I think it's important uh, for us to um, look at these things. And I'm going to have to figure out how to do this. Just hang on. I think the best way to do this is. Okay, so this is the calendar converter. And here we're looking at um, 977 BC. So this was opened up from before. And now we're going to go to 2018. Um, we're going to go to November. And we're going to go uh, to November 22nd. So if we look at this, what's the biblical date for November 22nd? <clears throat> so you're looking at the 13th day of the eighth month here. Right, so that's a symbol of Palmoni, right? Okay. And, and that, that's like August 13th, which we have in our line. It's a symbol of Palmoni. We have it in our line. But this is the biblical date. Uh, so the 13th day of the eighth month. So it doesn't line up with the 15th day of the eighth month. But, but it's not quite as simple as that. So we have November 22nd. We know November 22nd also lines up with November 9th in our history because they're 13 days apart. Um. So when I was looking at this, I was trying to say, well, how can I, how can I know uh, which is uh, the correct biblical date? So one is, 
the first day of the first month, most of the time we can we can be very precise about it. Um, but we have we have a number of different ways in which the calendar works. So most people would say it's the the sighting of the first visible crescent after the equinox in Jerusalem, you know, from the Temple Mount. So if you want to know what the first day of the first month is, you need to be in Jerusalem and you need to, to observe. You can't calculate it. Now, when we do our calculations, it's not like the rabbis. The rabbis have a set calendar. It's not based on observation. Now, what we try to do is instead of calculating it as some kind of set pattern, is we observe it using our knowledge of astronomy to go back into the past or into the future to determine when would the moon be, be visible. Now, what is some of the problems we run into? What's, what's the most obvious problem you run into when you want to observe uh, the visible crescent on the last day of the Jewish year in the spring? And, and you're not there. You're just doing, uh, um, you're doing some astronomy math. What would be the main problem that you would have? Could we, can we determine what the weather is like in the past through some mathematical calculation? Absolutely not. <laughs> right. So we can't know what the weather was like. So we can't know whether there was a great deal of humidity, which would obscure the observation of the first visible crescent. We don't know if there would be uh, wind, which might cause dust particles in the air that could also observe it. Or maybe there's smoke um, from fires or maybe, you know, ash from volcanoes. There's all kinds of things that could obscure the sighting of the first visible crescent that could delay it. Now, it can only be delayed a day because if it's not observed, you're not going to continue to wait till you observe it. The most you can do is um, add an extra day. So you always go on the evening of the 29th of the last month of the year. And if it's after the spring equinox, then um, if you see a visible crescent, then the next day is going to be the first day of the first month. Uh, but if you go out and you realize the equinox hasn't happened, you're going to add an extra month. And, and yet, if you go out and if you didn't see the visible crescent because it was obscured, you, know, you would go up the next, you wouldn't need to go up the next day, but you would need to observe whether an equinox has happened. So there's, there's all kinds of little difficulties Determining the equinox, how is that done? Um, and what's the standard for observation of a visible crescent? Um, you know, obviously they're not gonna just in the in ancient times use um, calculations. They're gonna observe it. Now, when it comes to our history, how did the Millerites determine the first day of the first month? I don't recall. Okay. So they didn't go to Jerusalem to observe the first visible crescent. Uh, they used uh, charts. Now, what city did they use instead of Jerusalem? Because they didn't use Jerusalem. What city did they use for their observations? Boston. They would have used the Farmer's Almanac. Right. So they used the Farmer's Almanac. They used Boston. So Boston is going to be the place from where they're going to determine um, when the first day of the first month is. Now, the Millerites don't quite understand the biblical calendar. They have this belief that the Jews always start at mon one month later, uh, or, or the Karaites start at one month later than the rabbis. So the, they think that the biblical calendar is always a month off from the rabbinic calendar, which isn't the case. They also believe that they observe every month. 
Now, that's true, and sometimes in the Bible, they would just observe every month. But when it comes to the biblical religious calendar, it has a fixed cycle of 30 and 29 days for the first six months. And after that, the months are going to be observed. So, um, so it becomes a bit of a difficulty in, in looking at... Now, I'm going to switch screens here. We're going to go to... Skyview Cafe. Now, I know that people can't see this really well, but I'm going to go back to 2018. So I'm just going back month by month. So here we have, um, this is October of 2018. And, and you can see that you're going to have a full moon. They're going to mark it here with the, the full moon and they're going to give the time. 1245. Now I'm looking at this from Boston. So what I'm going to show you is the difference. We're going to go to November uh, between Boston. So here's the new moon. That's the 7th of November. Um, now, of course, the visible crescent isn't going to be visible um, at the time of the day of the new moon, especially here. It's going to be 11 o'clock in the morning. So that evening, uh, you, you just, this, the moon is too close to the sun. They're setting too close together and you wouldn't, you wouldn't see uh, the visible crescent. And, and then you have uh, probably on the next day or maybe the day after that. Here, it looks like you're gonna look at the ninth and you would see uh, the first visible crescent and this is always showing what it looks like at sunset. So in the next day you would see more. So you would assume then the 10th is going to be the first day of the first month. Now, remember, we're now dealing with the eighth month, right? The seventh month is going to be in October. And that's, um, you know, so when you look in October here, the beginning of the seventh month is going to be here, but it's not going to be by observation. That is, they're not good. They're just going to go back from the first day of the first month. And then you're just going to calculate 30, 29, 30, 29. So when this month begins, it's going to be 100 and, um, 170, 170, what's six times 30, 180. So 178 days, right? So 178 days from the first day of the first month or 177, 177 days, right? Because there's going to be three months with 29. Okay. And then we go here. Now the beginning of this month is going to be determined by observation. Now, one of the problems that you have that you have to think about, I know... Hopefully people are following what, what I'm talking about here, because this, this to me is just really basic. But for many people, these are new ideas. So what day can you go out to look for the visible first visible crescent? What day of the month? Wouldn't it be right after the first new moon? Well, it, no, because you're going to have to see the first visible crescent. So, I mean, after the, so it's going to be the 29th day of the month, right? That's the day, that evening on the 29th. You want to see if the next day is going to be the first day of the month. If you see a visible crescent, then it will be. If you don't, it'll be the 30th, and then it will be followed by the first day of the month. You don't even need to go out on the 30th day of the month. Um, to look for the visible crescent. Because if, if you didn't see it on the 29th, then that day is the 30th, and the following day will be the first of the next month. So you only have, there's only one day every month that you would need to do that if you're observing the moon every month. Now, in the spring, they do that, 
And then they don't have to go out at the end of the second month or first month. They don't have to go out at the end of the second month. But finally, at the end of the seventh month, they need to. Out. But it's only going to be on the 29th day of the month. Now, there are rare occasions in which um, they might have seen a first visible crescent uh, on, the on the 27th if they had gone out. Um, based on how that those uh, 177 days lie within the cycles of the moon. Um, but you still wouldn't have a, 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 20, a 28th day month. So let me think here. Yeah, so you wouldn't go out on the 28th. So you might, yeah, you might see it on the 28th. I said 27th. On the 28th, you might see a first visible crescent, but you, you couldn't declare the next day the first day of the first month or the first day of the next month in this case. You couldn't do that because you have to have at least 29 days. So there would be no point going out on the 28th to look for the first visible crescent. Now, this is in Boston. So I just want to show you here. If I switch, so in Boston, it's going to be 11 o'clock in the morning that you have the astronomical new moon. And if I go to Jerusalem, it's going to be six o'clock in the evening. So how many hours difference is there between Boston and Jerusalem? Seven. Yeah, so you got seven hours difference, okay? Now, one thing you'll see here, maybe you can't, it depends how good your computer is, but you'll see here in Boston, you're actually going to see, you're going to have more opportunity to see the first visible crescent earlier than you would if you were seeing it in Jerusalem, because the moon has moved further through its orbit in those seven hours. And so you're much more likely to see it. All other things being equal, obviously atmospheric conditions are a huge factor. But if you're just doing a calculation on a computer, um, you can start earlier, um, that is the year will start earlier, one day, it can start one day earlier if you're using Boston than if you're using Jer Jerusalem in certain situations, not every time. So it can start one day earlier, um, which is the case in 1844, because we have October 22nd as the 10th day of the seventh month. And uh, at the beginning of the year, if they had used Jerusalem, um, and, and this is sort of, there's a whole bunch of other things I'm not bringing into account. Uh, they would have actually had October 23rd being the 10th day of the seventh month and April 20th being the first day of the first month. But that didn't happen. <coughs> Excuse me. So anyway, in trying to figure out this event in November. I could look at this, but I also have another tool that I can use. And it's this tool here. Now this is the uh, TorahCalendar.com. So some of you have seen me use this before. And in this one, I can go through and new moon day, that's the time in which you would see the first visible crescent. The next day after would be um, the first day of that month. So the ninth month, now in this one, they're using, they're starting the year earlier. So this would actually technically be the eighth month. And they're going to have the first day of the, uh, the, not, the eighth month is going to be on November 9th if you were to use this, if we used, um, whoops, just hang on. If we use the calendar converter. Now, did you see the other one? I'm just wondering if I did this properly. Yeah, I think so. Okay, if we use the calendar converter, uh, the first day of the eighth month is going to be November 10th. 
So you can see that we have a difference happening here in this calendar converter. So if I was using this Torah calendar, right, it's going to say the first day of the eighth month is going to be November 9th. And if I use this converter, it's going to be November 10th. So do people understand the problem? Is anybody not understanding? I, I know I, I try to take time to go through it to let you absorb it. But you, can you see the problem? It's not very simple to just know which day is a particular biblical date. And, and this is one of the problems that the lunar Sabbatarians have and also a feast keepers. So where are you going to determine that you're going to see the first visible crescent? And what are your criteria that you're going to use? When are you going to start the year? Are you going to start with the barley harvest or some other arbitrary event? Or are you going to take the equinox? And then how are you going to determine which is the day of the equinox? So do people understand that this is quite complex? It's not just exact. Okay. It, it's an intensely complex situation that you have taken quite a bit of time and effort to try to figure out. Right. So then when I dealt with this date, so if I was going to deal with November 9th being the first day of the first month, November 22nd would be which day of of this calendar. So if I'd use the Torah cal calendar and the ninth day of November is the first day of the eighth month, the 22nd of November would be which day of the biblical calendar. So which way would I correct this? That'd be the 12th. Okay, so are you sure? Or would you go the other direction? I'm not sure. <laughs> I know, see this is the thing is that we always have these problems. So. Yeah, I, I, I would think that you would be correct. So if I go to the 9th of November, that's going to be Tish, Tishri 29. And so what I would add to get to the 22nd is uh, I have to add how many days. And again, it's, it's sort of a... Fourteen, or how okay. So, <laughs> so if I'm just going to do a cardinal okay. count between the twenty second and the ninth is thirteen days. Or thirteen, yeah. Right. So that's why if if I just go thirteen days, that's going to bring me to November twenty second, and that's going to be the thirteenth day of the eighth month. Right. But now I'm going to. Uh, Address, adjust this calendar. So that means I would start it a day earlier. Wouldn't this then be the 14th if I started it one day earlier? Right, so that would have been instead of the 29th. Now, but you see part of the problem here that we have is that with the Torah calendar, I can't do that. And why can't I do that? So Let's go back here. So we're going to look at um, the 29th day. So this is the 29th day of, now that's going to be the ninth. And, and, and so what, what day would this have to be on the Torah calendar if, if the next day 
because this would have to be what date if I'm going to start if this if if the next day. Oh, man, this is confusing. <laughs> so the Torah calendar has this as the first day of the first month, right? So they're going to call this date the first day of the first month. So what date would they have had to go and look at the first visible crescent for, for this date to be the first day of the first month? Would they have to have gone out on the 28th? Correct? Because they're not going to call this uh, this 29th day of the seventh month. They're going to call this the first day of the first month. But if the day before was the 28th, then they couldn't have done that. So if we're using the biblical calendar, which is going to have the 28th day, I even, even if I could see the visible crescent on the 28th, right, which I could have, I still can't make this the first day of the first month, right? People understand what I'm talking about? I can't have the 29th of Tishri. I can't have November 9th because the day before is going to be the 28th. And so I have to have a 29th. So did I, did I do that correctly or am I doing it backwards? Right? Because they're going to make this the first day of the first month. Right? But yet, this is actually the 29th day of the first month on the biblical calendar, counting from the spring. They would do count the spring the same, but they're going to just have a shorter time. So, so you see the problem. If you're counting every month, it's going to be different than if you're counting um, 30, 29, 30, 29, 30, 29. So that's why, even though we could have seen a visible crescent here, we're going to have the 10th as being the first day of the first of the eighth month. Hopefully people understand what I'm talking about. I know there's going to be some of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, but the point is uh, if I'm using the biblical calendar, the earliest I can have the first day of the eighth month in 2018 is November 10th. So, so that's why this does November 10th. And then I'm going to add these days here to get to 12 days to get to, to this date. Now, what ended up happening, and, and we're going to address this a bit more uh, tomorrow, but what ended up happening in this history is we made a prediction. Now, the way that we based our prediction is what happened on November 22nd, 977 BC. So what happened on November 22nd, 977 BC? What was, what was Jeroboam doing that we can parallel or that, that we could, we would, if we were making a prediction before November 22nd, what prediction would you make? Would you connect Jeroboam with Trump first? Yes. Okay. So you're going to connect Jeroboam with Trump. And why? He's the head of state. Okay, so he's the head of the state, he's the king, okay? So that should be pretty clear. Now, now what is, what happens to Jeroboam? Is the same his thing, that, okay, his arm is gonna dry up, yeah. right? Okay, now, and somebody brought up a really good uh, reference about Jesus healing the man with the withered hand. Uh, and we're going to look at some of these things in more detail tomorrow because uh, I want to deal with these symbols. How do we decide to interpret a, a symbol? Where do we make an application? And uh, so there's a whole bunch of issues involved in this November 22nd prediction of how do we study the Bible? 
How do we make predictions based upon the past? And how do we understand symbols? And, and this was the issue back uh, in 2018. That was the issue that was being discussed in, in studying this. Now, only one person was willing to even discuss the issue, and that was Larry Hine. No one else there wanted even to discuss it. And Larry Hine understood the implications of it because he's one of the guys who asked questions regarding how can we know that our structure is sound? How can we make predictions? He asked that question. And I showed him how we could do it and what the basis, what the principles were behind it. So, so we can compare Trump with Jeroboam. And so we can then say what happens to Jeroboam must happen to Trump. So who is the prophet, the disobedient prophet? Aren't there more than one? Okay, maybe there's more than one, right? So we have a symbol of this disobedient prophet and, and that becomes an important symbol that we never really addressed back in 2018 because I didn't know how to address it. I didn't know who the disobedient prophet might be. But do you think that we can have an application now in hindsight that can get, to help us understand the disobedient prophet? Well, we have a disobedient prophet in Jeroboam's time, but do, do we not understand that there is a symbol of the disobedient prophet in Jonah. Okay, yes. So, because it's not just in Jeroboam's time, it's also in Jonah. We're going to see that same disobedience, a prophet who's directed by God to give a message, but doesn't follow all of the instructions. And so that disobedient prophet could have something to do with this movement. Right. But at that time, we couldn't see that because we wouldn't have had any knowledge about what was happening. And, and then we also have um, the fact that there is this prophecy given, and it's going to be a time prophecy that's connected with it. That is, it's a prophecy about Josiah. Josiah is going to be named, and there's time involved, even though it's not explicit at that time. But once we see the prophecy of Josiah being fulfilled and then used its fulfillment and the giving of it used by Ezekiel to predict the, the destruction of Jerusalem, then we can, we can say that um, there's obviously this disobedient prof, prophet is connected with the time prophecy. Correct? Even if it's just, Ezekiel, even if it's just Ezekiel going back and using that, it's still connected. So that prophecy that he's, he proclaims is going to be connected to time. So, and then we also have the symbols of what happens to him. We know that he's, he's, he's not going to go where God told him to go. He was supposed to go back another way and he wasn't supposed to stop and visit anyone. So he's going to stop a guy who claims to be a prophet is going to give him a false message from God, and he's going to heed that. So in all of these things, can you see that this November 22nd prediction is extremely important for us to understand at this time? It's completely necessary for us to understand it at this time. Yeah, because I believe this is the time for us now to understand this in the time after our disappointment. And so this is not just some uh, interesting uh, diversion into some past history that I was involved in. This is actually really essential, especially in regard to time setting, because that's what we're studying right now. Jeff spoke against time setting and we're going to agree with him. We're not time setters, but yet we made this prediction. And we have this November 22nd prediction that could have helped us 
But this movement was disobedient. We also then can see that there's lots of internal aspects to this prediction and mostly internal, but also there are external aspects. So we, because we're naming Trump, so Trump is connected. Now, the prediction that we made is that Trump's hand would be restrained, but we didn't know in what way or what manner. So that's what we're gonna look at tomorrow is to look at the restraint that happened on November 22nd, 2018, or at least in connection with November 22nd, 2018. And then we would say that his hand is going to be loosed. So if his hand's restrained, just like Jeroboam, his hand is going to be loosed. And so, so that's what that was based upon that. We decided, okay, there's something going to happen with Trump. Now we also had the North and the South involved. So we didn't know what that meant. We didn't know if this had anything to do with Russia and the United States. We just didn't know. Um, so you can see that there's a bunch of symbols and for somebody prior to November 22nd to sort of interpret this, would we have enough information to know what these events would be? Not really. No, there is no way. I mean, I would have to know what was going on in this movement behind the scenes. And I would have to know uh, what these symbols meant. And, and there's no way to interpret them until after the event. Now, some people would say, well, that's kind of a cop-out because you should have been able to understand the symbols and know how to apply them. But symbols can have more than one meaning. And we also have different levels happening, different layers of, of events that are unfolding. And at that time, we're really uncertain about what's coming. And God's not revealing this to us. All he's showing us is that we're in this line of prophecy. He's given us this prediction, November 9th, and this other prediction, July 18th. And then, then we're in the midst of trying to understand these prophecies and time prophecies, and he, and he puts November 22nd, 2018 on our lap. Now, the movement is not going to heed this prophecy. That is, it's going to fight against it. It's going to suppress it. It's going to ignore it. And then it's going to use it as a weapon. It's going to be one of their main arguments against uh, the, those that are time setting, so to speak, after July 18th. So, so on December 6th, uh, 2020, when they put out their declaration, even though they don't really state it explicitly in that declaration, one of the main arguments that they had against what we were doing had to do with the November 22nd, 2018 prediction. And Larry Hine was connected to it. And he was part of the, one of the persons who said, we couldn't, we can't use numbers in this way. Now, as I said before, in 2019, on November 10th, Jeff is going to hear three presentations. Stephen's gonna be there too, uh, as well as Odilio where we're going to be presenting, where I'm going to be presenting November 22nd. Now, I don't have much time to do it, even though we do three presentations. And I think mostly the third presentation was Jeff going up and asking questions and looking at it and basically him giving his interpretation of what he thought it meant. And, and he's going to look at the turkey and all this stuff as a symbol of turkey, things like that. I'm not sure that I necessarily agreed with his interpretation. What I did agree with is the idea that when we look at these lines and we look at these dates, it's sound. That is, we really can't argue against uh, placing Trump and these Thanksgivings as insignificant. We have to accept that these are um, sound, uh, symbols to look at, at, at to tie 
the history of 977 to our time. But it's just how we're trying to understand this now as in, in retrospect, looking back two and a half years later, almost three years later, I think that we can see some things that we wouldn't have been able to see then. So any questions, things that you think that I need to address or make clear when we come before we go into this stuff tomorrow? I think I'm going to have to watch this again to really get a, a good perspective as to what questions I have to ask. Okay. And, and if anybody has questions, just email me, Theodore James Turner at gmail.com, and, and I can address those questions. But you can see, I mean, I hope people can see that this is sound, right? This isn't, um, you know, what, what we're looking at here with this line is not something that's, that's arbitrary or contrived. It's things that we already believe and that we already taught. It's just that we then, and, and we taught about Trump. So the question was, what part did Trump play? And what part did November 22 play? And, and I think it plays a major role in why we're where we are today. So I can't think of anything else that I could say other than we need to pray. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, we are very thankful uh, for this study. I know, Lord, it's a lot to take in uh, for most minds, um, things that people have not spent time studying and um, pulling them all together can, can take a while. But Lord, you know that uh, you have a reason for this. And we want to understand these dates and the symbols being employed. Um, we are thankful, Lord, for the things that you've been bringing to our attention, dealing with 158 and, one, and 16, 161 BC, and how to understand these symbols. And we pray, Lord, that we can use that knowledge in this study. Be with us in our work. Help us to glorify your name on the earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.